Okay, this is going to be the first lecture on neurophysiology. Um, here we're just going to kind of look at the whole structure of the nervous system, uh, look at uh, maybe a more integrated perspective, looking at how the nervous system relates to the metabolic processes in the body. Then we'll look at the uh, embryological development, tie that into um, acupuncture and how the acupuncture meridians, especially the extraordinary vessels, have an interesting parallel with the description of the development of the nervous system. And then we'll look at the actual structures of the main cells comprising nervous tissue, which would be the neurons, the actual nerve cells, and then the neural glia. Neural glia are the uh, supporting cells. And then we'll say a bit about the regeneration of nerve tissue. Here's a few resources. Um, the notes are fairly complete, but if you wanted to follow along in any standard anatomy and physiology text, I'd recommend either Holes or Totora. Um, those are just two examples, there's many out there. And you don't need to get the most recent edition either. You can find them, the older editions, at a better cost. So it might be helpful just to read along. These notes are kind of designed to follow a text like that pretty closely. Um, if you wanted to get into more details, I list a few here on neurophysiology and then um, some of the integrated texts uh, kind of looking at uh, relating biomedicine with Chinese medicine. So that's uh, optional reading, but it might be helpful uh, to follow along. All right, so the nervous system is actually the smallest and most complex of the, uh, from the biomedical perspective, the 11 body systems. Um, that, that maintain homeostasis. It has a mass, total mass, of only about four and a half pounds. That's about, just about 3% of the total body weight. Uh, but it's, of course, one of the most complex of the different body systems. The nervous system specifically takes in information, coordinates that, um, and then uh, relays that to, for example, smooth muscle or somatic muscle uh, to relate different activities. So it has an integrative sort of correlative function. I'll speak a little bit more about that here in just a moment. Um, the nervous system with the endocrine system, and you can maybe throw in the immune system as well, are the three primary systems that maintain homeostasis. And that's a really interesting discussion that, you know, more traditional medicines like Chinese medicine, naturopathy and whatnot, really we can say they're emphasis is on how do we maintain homeostasis rather than how do we just stop or suppress a disease process. Um, in the more traditional medicines, disease itself is seen as, a, seen as a disruption of homeostasis. And in the Western tradition, the name from ancient Greece of the homeostatic system was called the vis medicatrix naturae. Sometimes that translates as the healing power of nature, but basically it's the internal forces that maintain the inner terrain and uh, the nervous system, and that would include the um, what we think of as the brain and the spinal cord, the so-called central nervous system, but also the peripheral and autonomic nervous systems, fight or flight, sympathetic and parasympathetic, rest and digest nervous systems. These are um, helping to maintain homeostasis. We can say the nervous system works from one end and then the endocrine system through the blood uh, works from the other end. Um, and so does the immune system. So they both uh, help to maintain that balance. The first uh, nervous systems evolutionarily were found in kind of worm-like organisms about 550 million years ago that first evolved. And um, these, um, this has, we can see that in invertebrates, uh, sort of a certain level of complexity which then gets more and more complex with time. So the primary cells of the nervous system, uh, as I mentioned, are neurons, the actual nerve cells, and then supporting cells called neuroglia. And the estimate is the neuroglia actually outnumber the neurons by about 10 to one. So most of the uh, actual number of cells in nerve tissue is neuroglia, but by weight, by mass, the neurons actually still comprise the majority. Um, it's actually, nervous tissue is very cell dense. There's very little extracellular space, although there is extracellular space. And in fact, there's something called the glymphatic system, which is a recent discovery in anatomy. Um, it's been suspected for many years that the uh, spaces between the neurons have to be washed um, daily. And that happens actually every night when um, a person is in uh, what's called slow wave sleep rhythms, the neurons and the spaces between them actually shrink. And then the uh, cerebral spinal fluid uh, 
is able to wash through the nerve tissue and that washes away waste products and degraded proteins and so forth. So we think that's actually part of a normal repair and recovery process. And so that's called now the glymphatic system. Um, you probably know this, but the medical specialty that focuses on studying and diagnosing and treating nervous system disorders is neurology. And then um, neuroscience, of course, is the specialty that kind of looks more at the basic science of the nervous system. Um, so we're going to start the first few lectures here on neuroscience, and then we're going to jump up to neurology, and then we'll look at psychiatry, which is more looking at mental health uh, disorders. So there are two primary divisions of the nervous system. The central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord. And what's interesting about this is that the brain and spinal cord are surrounded by um, a layer of tissues called the meninges. It's actually a three-layered level of tissues. And that effectively separates the central nervous system from the rest of the body. Uh, in fact, all the blood vessels that go into the central nervous system have an additional layer around them called the blood-brain barrier and I'll speak a little bit more about the structure of that here in a bit. And the blood-brain barrier actually prevents a lot of substances from the blood from reaching the central nervous system. So there's an interesting image here, phenomenologically, of the nervous system sort of isolating itself uh, from the physical tissues. And I'll, I'll speak more on that in just a little bit. Um, the second part of the nervous system is the peripheral nervous system, or PNS. And it's divided further into the somatic nervous system, um, and that is the nervous system that essentially both controls voluntary muscle, but also is involved in conscious sensation. So things like uh, touch and pressure and, and so forth. Uh, that's all part of the somatic division of the nervous system. The autonomic nervous system, um, that's actually comprised of the sympathetic or fight or flight and the parasympathetic divisions. That's the second division of the peripheral nervous system. And that's regulating a lot of the, most of the unconscious activities, for example, smooth muscle dilation, uh, the tone on arteries, the smooth muscle on arteries, on the intestinal uh, smooth mus uh, muscle, and so forth. And then there is a third branch, which has now recently been included, and that's the enteric nervous system. And that's specifically the nervous system of the gut. So the gut actually has um, as many, in fact, more nerves than the spinal cord. And um, this is now being called the second brain. But the gut nervous system is incredibly important for regulating normal digestive function. And um, we find that there's a disorder in the gut nervous system in a lot of different conditions like irritable bowel syndrome and potentially even in the inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, so that's the uh, enteric nervous system. There are a number of other smaller bundles of sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, for example, around the heart. That's called the cardiac plexus. There's a so-called celiac, or used to be called the solar plexus, around the upper digestive organs, the mesenteric and then pelvic plexus. So I'll go through these different nerve bundles, but they're incredibly important for regulating the organs that they're connected with, regulating their activity. Um, the peripheral nervous system is not surrounded by the meninges, so it's not as separated <clears throat> from the tissues as the central nervous system is. Now, a couple of interesting terms is that um, we usually think of nerves as comprising the nervous system, but technically nerves are only found in the peripheral nervous system. Um, and uh, what a nerve is, is essentially, if you look at a neuron, a nerve cell, I'll go through the details here in a little bit, it has a cell body called a soma. Um, and then branching from the soma are a number of little tentacles called dendrites. And these dendrites are going to allow the nerve to receive information from other nerves or from other tissue. And then that information's processed and it usually induces what's called an action potential, a nerve current, down a long thin thread called an axon. And at the end of the axon is a little terminal and then neurotransmitter typically is secreted um, and then that might act on another nerve or another tissue. So um, a nerve itself is just a bundle of axons. So almost like little cables that are packed together insulation. And some of the bigger nerves, like a sciatic nerve, have uh, thousands of, hundreds of thousands of axons in them. Um, and so nerves are technically only in the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, there are tracks of axons, and so we call those tracks, nerve tracks. Um, so that's just a little bit of a difference there. 
Um, the couple other terms to know, efferent nerves with an E, um, carry information from the central nervous system out to the body. So we might think of those as like motor nerves. They, they carry information from the brain out to a tissue. Afferent nerves, on the other hand, with an A, carry information, usually sensory information, from the body back to the central nervous system. So a good example of that is the vagus nerve. You might have heard it's, it's a big nerve in the parasympathetic nervous system. It starts in the brainstem, and there's actually two vagus nerves. They wind down to the middle of the chest on either side of the esophagus. And then they go down and they go through the diaphragm and then they innervate the intestines. <clears throat> um, they also send branches to the lungs and to the heart. Um, so the vagus has a motor function. So information from the brain can then signal the gut or the heart or the lungs to function differently. But interestingly, we found that 80% of the vagal fibers are actually sensory. So they're bringing information back. So they're afferent. So vagus is an example of a mixed afferent and efferent nerve. A um, couple other terms, cranial nerves. There are 12 cranial nerves and they exit from the cranium. Um, so they are usually associated with the brain. So they actually come mostly from the brainstem. They start there and they innervate the face and the upper shoulder muscles, the tongue, the eyes, and, and that sort of thing. Um, the spinal nerves exit from the spinal cord and they're the ones that go out and there's a branch of each spinal nerve has a motor branch and then a sensory branch. And then they go out in and out from the different muscles and the different tissues. So those are just some uh, technical terms to know. So again, in the nerve tissue, the two primary cells are neurons and neuroglia or glial cells. Um, the neurons comprise about 10% of the nerve tissue. Neuroglia are about 90% of the neural tissue. Um, neurons are a little different. They're electrically excitable. Um, and that's because they have very specialized ion channels on their cell surfaces. So we'll talk about the details in the next lecture. Um, but those are going to allow for specific electrical currents. Uh, and there are two primary electrical currents that happen. And these happen on the surface, just under the surface of the, um, uh, the cell surface of the neuron. And these are called graded potentials. These happen up in the dendrites. Um, and then action potentials. Those happen in the axons. Um, so we'll look at uh, how those are both generated and why they're important. Um, there are about 100 billion neurons in the central nervous system. And the neurons are all interconnected via what are called synapses. And uh, synapses really are little spaces. So if you look down at the picture here, here's a neuron with its soma. Here you see the dendrites. And when inter what's interesting about neurons is information is always unidirectional. So it's going to come in from the dendrites. Um, it's going to start graded potentials in the dendrites. Those then, if they reach a certain threshold potential here in this little region called the axon hillock, will trigger an action potential along the surface of the axon, just under the surface. And then uh, at the very end of the axon, there are little branches. And uh, at the end of each branch, there's a little bulb, and these bulbs contain neurotransmitter. And so there's a space, and the neurotransmitter is going to be secreted. And then it's going to act usually on the dendrites of another um, uh, neuron. So we usually call this first neuron the presynaptic neuron and the second neuron the postsynaptic neuron. Um, so if you look at the number of um, uh, synapses, it actually brings the number of synapses up with the number of neurons in the central nervous system to about a hundred trillion. So that is an incredibly uh, complex, sophisticated system, not even closely mimicked by any computer system we have today. Um, and all of this is found in that, you know, almost, you know, just like two and a half pounds, three pounds of, of you know, neural tissue up there in the brain. So it's an incredibly efficient system. Um, there are three types of neurons based on their function. We usually, they're usually grouped together in complex neural networks. Uh, these would be sensory neurons, interneurons, which connect usually sensory and then motor neurons, which um, then send information out. So the sensory usually are the afferent and then the motor neurons are the efferent neurons. Um, I mentioned the structure of the neurons. They have the dendrites. The dendrites further, and I'll show you pictures of this here in a little bit, have little spines on them, and that actually increases their surface area, and they have receptors for specific neurotransmitters. So it's the single neuron could have receptors actually for dozens of different neurotransmitters. Interestingly, though, that same neuron will only secrete via its synapse one 
specific type of neurotransmitter. So we can actually classify neurons by the type of neurotransmitter they secrete. So some of them only secrete serotonin, some secrete GABA, some secrete glutamate, uh, but they might all be able to receive information from GABA secreting neurons or serotonin secreting neurons and so forth. So it can get pretty complicated. Again, the information flow is unidirectional from dendrites to some of the axons. I mentioned that nerves refer to bundles of axons um, in the peripheral nervous system only. In the central nervous system, there are tracks, so technically no nerves in the brain or the spinal cord. Um, and then the synapses, again, are the narrow gaps, usually separating neurons. Um, they're very small, about 100 to 200 nanometers. In fact, they're usually not visible with the light microscope. Um, and uh, when physiologists first started looking at the neural tissue over 100 years ago. A famous uh, histologist, physiologist was Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Um, he basically uh, was not able to see synapses, but he intuited that there must be a gap there. So he actually created what is now our current idea that the nervous system is not a completely interconnected whole, that there are spaces between the nerves. Um, it's not what's called a syntitium. That said, um, there's actually been a lot more evidence in the last couple of decades that in addition to chemical synapses, there are what are called electrical synapses where the nerves do actually butt up right next to each other and little ionic currents can be transferred between one neuron and the next and that does form an interconnected whole. So say the nervous system is very complex. It has the chemical synapses and then these more electrical synapses. So a lot of interesting discussion about, you know, we usually associate consciousness with the nervous tissue. How does consciousness come about from these physiological activities? We know a lot about the different, uh, you know, currents and the electrical currents and properties of the neurons, but how does that translate into a thought or a feeling? These things are not measurable um, in the physical sense. So it's, it's still a huge problem at the core of physiology. And the current explanation is, well, somehow the consciousness comes from the activity of the nerves, but that's actually not, uh, that's, that's a hypothesis, and that's never been actually firmly established, and that still is opening up a lot of debate. You know, it brings up the question, does consciousness come from the brain and the central nervous system, or is the brain and central nervous system more a receiver for consciousness? And there's actually some interesting evidence of the latter, that, that the brain is like a giant antenna which if you prepare it in the right way to receive, you can receive thoughts and so forth. And um, this is actually the heart of a more esoteric worldview, which is really the basis of Western philosophy. The Greek philosophers thought that, that the brain and uh, so forth was really kind of a secondary organ. It was more just like a receiver uh, for uh, higher forces. And the organs actually uh, are able to receive that information and take it further. So I'll speak more about that. But right now there's interesting discoveries based on both the electrical and the chemical synapse idea. Um, the nature of nerves is interesting. Nerves are very, you could say they, they have these electrical properties, but they're, they don't regenerate very well. In fact, this is the problem with damaging parts of the brain is that these neurons in the majority of the brain, there's a few exceptions, don't regenerate. Um, we do know there's a lot of neuroplasticity. So if you lose, for example, nerve tissue in a stroke, um, that that tissue will not regenerate, but the synapses can reform around that tissue and a person can regain function. So it's not that we don't regain function, but it's interesting that um, in as actual tissue, it's very different than like the tissue in your digestive tract, which is regenerating usually every two, three days completely. The nerve tissue is there for life. In fact, the neurons you have at birth are the neurons you have for the rest of your life. And from the moment of birth onward, we undergo a process of neural pruning where the neurons actually shrink and shrink and shrink. Um, so we get fewer neurons with age. They become better connected and that's what learning is all about. But the total number of neurons decreases. Again, there's a few areas of the brain where that's not true. We now know that in a place called the hippocampus, for example, which is involved in memory, um, that that area can regenerate neurons. But for most of it, you know, if you cut out a big chunk of your brain, it's not going to regenerate. It'll just be replaced with scar tissue, if, if anything.
Um, so we can say it has a very poor regenerative potential. Um, it's very crystalline. In fact, it's almost like salt, you know, salt that's precipitated out in a way. And salt processes um, create form and structure, and that's an interesting insight about nerves as one of their main activities beyond sensing and sending these impulses to muscles is to form, to create form and structure in the body. Um, that's exactly opposite of what, for example, your digestive organs and your uh, metabolism does, which is to provide living substance, living activity. So you think there's two primary activities in the body. There's the forming, shaping activity. We can, in Chinese medicine, relate that to the yang activity almost like hands shaping clay. That's what the nerve activity does. And then the uh, metabolic activity, um, that's more yin. It's, it's more substantive. It's filled with life, it, nourishment and so forth, uh, but it has no form, it has no shape. So both these activities have to come together. So the nerves are one pole of the whole here. And so you can see that in the very nature of the nerves. They have, they're very, sh almost like someone's drawn them out, overshaped them, over salted them. So you can say they're very yin in substance, but yang in their overall activity. Now glial cells are interesting. Again, they are um, comprise more of the neural tissue. There's about 10 times more glial cells than neurons. Um, they, for decades after their initial discovery in the late 1800s, were thought to be more just like filling in the brain and didn't have a real role. Uh, but we now know that they are actively supportive of neurons. In fact, because neurons don't have that regenerative high levels of life activity, it's really the glial cells which provide them with that life, that provide them with the right nourishment, with, with, with what are called nerve growth factors, um, and that help support their uh, recycling of proteins and so on and so forth. Um, the uh, main type of glial cell actually that maintains the life activities of the neurons, we'll look at it in detail, is called an astrocyte. Um, and astrocytes, we now know, also can propagate their own types of ionic currents, different than action potentials or graded potentials, and they use calcium um, as uh, an electrolyte versus in the action potentials, it's sodium and potassium that are the main electrolytes. Um, but astrocytes can, in a way, conduct the, their own little nerve currents. Um, the equivalent of an astrocyte in the peripheral nervous system is a satellite cell. So astrocytes are in the central nervous system, satellite cells are in the peripheral nervous system, and they help protect the peripheral nerves. In the central nervous system, we have oligodendrocytes, and they provide what's called myelin, which is the insulation sheath around nerves. And we'll look at myelin more closely and what it does, but it's basically going to help the uh, conduction of the electrical currents in the um, uh, neurons. In the peripheral nervous system, the same kind of cell is called a Schwann cell. So Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes provide myelin. Microglia found in the central nervous system, these are macrophages that are specialized for cleaning up um, any sort of bacteria or other microbes or whatnot that have invaded the central nervous system. And then there's a very special type of cell in the central nervous system called an ependymal cell, and these secrete cerebral spinal fluid. So they're interesting cells. They line the ventricles, which are the inner cavities in the brain, and they secrete the cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, right into there and uh, maintain the environment. Um, so these are highly regenerative cells. If they're injured, they can repair. They're highly metabolic. You can say they're, in the old language of alchemy, the kind of activity that leads to life, that leads to substance, was called sulfur, versus the forming activity was called salt. You can say they're very sulfur-like, connect with life activities. We'd say they're very yang in substance, but very yin in activity. They have more of a, a nourishing kind of uh, nutritive activity in general. So these are the neuroglia. We'll go over the neuroglia in more detail later, but I um, just want to point out this one picture down here. You see two um, neurons. We see the cell bodies, the axons, and what's interesting about the axons here is that you see that there's a little, looks like little sausages around them. That's the myelin. That's the sheath. And so that's going to help insulate the electrical signal as it passes down. And then it's going to reach the end of the axon. It's going to release neurotransmitters into synapses, which will connect to the second or postsynaptic cell. And then um, if there's enough intensity of that signal, it'll stimulate a second signal in this axon and so on. So that sort of shows how these things are interconnected. 
the cells like astrocytes would be on the outside here and they are going to protect and um, nourish uh, the cells. Okay, so the primary functions of nerves, I've, I've spoken about some of them already. You know, we have a sensory function and of course, the neurons that are sensory neurons are connect, connected to sensory receptors. Um, so there's all sorts of different types of sensory receptors. Of course, the retinal cells, we have olfactory cells in the nose, um, we have auditory cells in the cochlea, and so on and so forth. Um, there are special pressure sensors in the skin and, and proprioceptors for sensing position and muscles and so forth. But all of these sensory nerves are usually connected with some sensors. Some of them are just free nerve endings. In fact, a lot of pain receptors are just free nerve endings. And if they get irritated by different chemicals or especially present in inflammation, they will start firing and that's what leads to the pain sensation. Uh, some of them are integrative, as I mentioned. They integrate the information from the sensory neurons and then output that information to neuro motor neurons. And then the motor neurons um, are going to, usually they're connected to a muscle, uh, either a somatic voluntary muscle like skeletal muscle or to a smooth muscle. And then in some cases, a uh, cardiac muscle as well. Um, so these are going to um, regulate the motor function. On a deeper level, you'd say that, again, the nerve activity is very formative. It helps to bring form structures. We can say the nerves inform the shapes of the body. If you cut the nerves into an area, a very interesting thing happens, and that's that that area loses its form. It kind of goes to jelly. So in a sense, the nerves have to be in there to shape that activity. Um, on a very interesting level, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a, in a bit, in addition to the electrical currents in the nerves, there's some emerging information that nerves also can carry inner light. And this is very interesting. So you might remember from cell physiology that the um, microtubules are part of the cytoskeleton of cells and neurons are very rich in microtubules. These are proteins which are like a long tube and they're hollow in the middle. And it turns out the shape of the microtubules is actually the exact shape that's needed to be like a uh, fiber optic cable to conduct light. And so there's some interesting work looking at how if you cut uh, an axon and put a very sensitive camera at the end, that axon starts spritzing out light. And that light is not random. In other words, it's not just from random chemical reactions. Chemical reactions always release energy and some of that's in the form of light and heat. Um, it's actually organized light. It's what we call coherent, like the light in a laser. And that means that it's carrying biological information. And so there's some interesting work going on with biophoton research. Uh, German researcher Fritz Albert Popp, P-O-P-P, -P, sort of founded the field. He actually didn't found it, but he uh, carried it forward. And he found that this light is coherent. And uh, many others now have taken up the baton and have worked with this. Um, so we can think of nerves as potentially also carrying an inner light activity throughout the body, light conductors. And that um, is interesting because there is a theory of consciousness that says that actually the electrical information in nerves is too slow to account for consciousness and that there must be a faster system. And the, um, this particular theory, um, and I'll say more about this in a bit, it's called uh, orc or um, is uh, basically saying that it's the light structures in the central nervous system, which through quantum effects are able to create these incredible dimensions of consciousness that we're just now beginning to, to comprehend in the modern sense that people, of course, that have practiced meditation and whatnot for many millennia have, have tapped into this. Um, so that's maybe another activity is the inner light activity. Now, there's a very interesting way of looking at physiology, and that's to say that all physiology really boils down to three fundamental processes. Um, and I think this is helpful for understanding how the nervous system fits in with the other tissues here. So one physiologic process is information exchange. And this is really immaterial. In other words, it's happening through electrical impulses, light, things like that. But basically, information form is maintained. A um, good example of that is like a busy highway um, and you have all this energy, but it's not really being directed. And you can have a single traffic light, which runs at maybe 12 volts of you know, electricity, and it's able to actually control this entire stream of energy. 
So think of the nervous system like that. It's able to direct through the right pipelines, the energy flows in the body. And um, so it has a formative function. The opposite of that would be what happens in your metabolism. And that's working more with material substances. So you eat some food, that uh, glucose in the food is transformed, you're gonna break it down in the cells, it's going to uh, make ATP and have energy, and so on. So you're working with substances with energy, but again, without the direction of the nervous system, it wouldn't have any form to it. Um, so this is the opposite of the nerve activity, um, but it's centered in the digestive organs. So interestingly, physiologically, we can say that the form activity is centered more up in the head, um, reaches down into the body, and the metabolic activity centered more down in the body reaches up into the head. So for example, the glial cells could be seen as an image of the metabolic activity in the head, uh, specifically. So that's the opposite, more being more with the material element, not so much the immaterial. And then interestingly, you have to have between the form processes and the metabolic processes a way to exchange that information. And that's where you might say there's a rhythmic or periodic processes that occur in physiology. And they're really centered in the rhythms of your breathing and also circulation. So in a sense, the heart and lungs are mediating that. So it's very interesting because you can link all three of these together. And what you almost have here is an image of the human being. You know, here's the chest, here's your metabolic system and so forth. So these three processes are seen in every cell, every organ, every tissue. So as we go through physiology, we're gonna be looking at these three. Um, I'll just jump ahead here and say that in pathology, these processes are disturbed. And part of the process of healing is to bring them back into their right alignment. If the nerve processes overshoot their mark, become too formative, interestingly, the result is what we call fibrosis or sclerosis. And that's really where you have excess collagen being deposited, excess form. And interestingly, we know there's a lot of nerve activity that coordinates that. So you can say hardening processes like atherosclerosis. We can even think of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's where we have misfolded overshaped proteins that are not being dissolved again in the nerve tissue. Um, that's another sclerotic process. Uh, a lot of arthritis with you know scarring and that sort of thing. That's, that's a scarring fibrotic process. So we can say all of that's involved with excess nerve activity. On the other hand, the metabolic activity if it gains its upper hand, what you have is acute inflammation. In fact, acute inflammation is healing when it's uh, occurring in a proper sense. So that's really your life activity is trying to restore balance to a tissue. When you sprain your ankle, you have to first dissolve all those tissues, then rebuild them, and that's where healing happens. And so that's what inflammation does. It's very dissolving at first, and then the fibrotic hardening processes step in secondly. Um, so in a way, acute inflammation is where the nerve activity is maybe if it's going too long, it's not being regulated properly, the nerve activity isn't jumping in to maintain that balance. Um, so this is an interesting perspective to say that really all pathology boils down to either too much hardening processes or too much acute inflammatory processes, which is more softening. Now, of course, chronic inflammation is interesting because it actually has both the acute inflammation component, but it also has the hardening component. In fact, the outcome of chronic inflammation is scarring usually, a fibrosis. Um, so we can think of chronic inflammation really as a breakdown of the rhythm between the acute inflammation and the more hardening processes. So as we go through each pathological condition in every organ, we'll actually find uh, that they all fall into you know, a disturbance of one of these three different patterns. I'll just mention an excellent place to read more about this is Johannes Rowan. Um, he's uh, now deceased, but he was a very famous anatomist. And one of the last books he, uh, he, he wrote in his life was called Functional Morphology. Um, and um, he basically you know, talks about physiology and anatomy from the perspective of these threefold principles. So um, this is um, an idea that goes back to, we find this, for example, in anthroposophy and anthroposophic medicine, but also going back to even things like alchemy. The alchemist Paracelsus talked about salt, sulfur, mercury processes. Um, and you find this in Ayurveda, of course. So it's a very universal kind of principle. But I think um, Yohan, uh, Rowan takes it into a modern perspective and 
it, uh, it, it really is very integrative. Here's just one more look at the threefold physiology. So from the nerve activities, again, you can think of the information processing, we have the formative activity. And a very interesting notion behind formation is that it is fundamentally catabolic. That means breaking down. If you want to shape out of a lump of clay a vase, you have to actually take some of the clay away. You have to carve it out in a certain sense. So it's um, the nerves have a shaping, kind of breaking down activity. And if we actually look at the whole metabolism of neurons, the production of neurotransmitters, for example, is not an anabolic or building up process. It's breaking down. Technically, in chemistry, you, you may remember that anabolism is when you take two substances like to say two molecules a and b and then you connect them via covalent bond a b so you get a bigger more complicated substance storing energy that's anabolic going the other way breaking a b down into its individual components is catabolic so again the nerve activity has more of that catabolic activity so it's yang in activity Again, the substance of nerves is, is very yin, it's not very regenerative, there's not a lot of life activity in them. And we usually correlate the nerves with, of course, our thinking, the seat of our thinking now. And that's not to say that thinking comes from the nerves, but we need a nervous system to think. Now, of course, in modern uh, thinking, a lot of people associate things like feeling as well as desires and will uh, with the nervous system. But interestingly, that is that is also a hypothesis and we have evidence to the contrary on that as well. So I'll just talk about that here in a second. Again, if nerve processes overstep their mark, we develop sclerosis or hardening. And they're focused mostly up in the head, but of course we have the peripheral nervous system, the enteric nervous system, and the parasympathetics. So the nerves distribute throughout the body. We can say their locus is up here uh, towards the head. Um, and in the head, we have an interesting image of a rounded skull with the soft tissue on the inside. Now, an interesting idea is to think that the Chinese concept of qi is really representing a type of formative energy. And that this is part of the energy that streams through the neurons. And it may very well be related to that inner light activity. And I'll come back to some of our current hypotheses on acupuncture, but there's a very a uh, strong movement in the research arena right now looking at how acupuncture meridians are highly correlated with nerves and especially autonomic nerves and uh, visceral sensory nerves and how by stimulating points on the skin where there are very special neurovascular bundles this can influence uh, organ activity in the distal part of the body through the nerve connections. And uh, this is now being mapped out by a number of different researchers. So very strong uh, evidence kind of correlating the qi activity with the uh, nerve activity. At the other end, we have focused down in our metabolic organs, usually below the diaphragm, we have the metabolic activity. So the intestines, the stomach, the liver, the pancreas, spleen, uh, all of those metabolic organs are, again, working with substances, usually in a more anabolic way. Um, and we can say they're very yin in activity, more yang in the living substance. Um, if we ask, you know, we don't usually think of ourselves as thinking with our gut, although there is a type of gut thinking, of course. We can say we have an intuitive flash about something. People say, you know, it's a gut intuition. And that might very well have relate to the nerve activity that's down there. Um, but interestingly, we can make a pretty strong argument that what is really centered in your metabolic organs is what you might call your will activity. And that's your seat of your desires. Most of them are unconscious for us. We just react to them. But with training, you can actually begin to understand what these will impulses are and you can work with them, transform them. Um, but the will is based in the organs. And we have that same correlation in Chinese medicine. We say the liver is sort of the basis of the will. There's a different type of will in the kidneys and so forth. So um, that these are not, will is not something part of the brain. It's actually part of your body. And this, this will have a very important implications for working with mental health disorders, looking at things like depression. We usually think of depression as a brain problem. But if we look at a, you know, study depression closely, we find that really there's a paralysis, not so much in thinking, which is more of a brain activity, but rally is a paralysis in the will, the ability to actually want or have the desire just to get up and do something. 
Um, and so that speaks more to a problem in an underlying organ. And clinically, we see that all the time where a lot of times just supporting the liver metabolism, now the depression miraculously lifts. Um, and so that's showing us that again, things like will are not necessarily centered in the brain. Um, they relate more to the metabolic organs. Um, in fact, the generation of the blood is dependent on these metabolic organs. And so the Chinese concept of shui or blood, we say is seated in your metabolic system. And what's interesting about the metabolic system, if you look below the diaphragm, you know, it's hollow. There's no bone surrounding like in the skull here. And then if you look down in the limbs where your muscles are, we have solid bone on the inside and then the soft tissue on the outside. So the opposite of the head. So the head is more rounded. Here we have more of a linear gesture. So curious that these two principles have a polarity like this in the body. It's right there in front of us, but we often don't look at these relationships. And then finally, again, I mentioned there's a rhythmical element that has to tie in the neuroformative element with the metabolic substantive element. And we can think of that as being centered in the rhythms of the heart and the lungs in the chest. And what's very interesting about the chest is that here we have the rounded feature of the skull, but then the linear feature, the ribs, like the limbs. And so it actually combines both the upper and the lower processes together. Um, and this is what maintains your inner balance. So you can say yin and yang here, the activities alternate. Um, now what's interesting here is that in the language of 19th century philosophy, philosophers thought that really there were three components to the human soul. One was thinking, the other was willing, desire, and the third is feeling. But that really comprises all of our inner activities in the soul life. And again, we think, you know, a lot of people talk today about feeling being in the brain, and we talk about, we'll talk more about this later, the so-called limbic system in the brain as being a feeling activity. But curiously, um, there's some data pointing out, actually the brain responds secondarily. We become conscious of the feeling after there's a change in breathing or circulatory rhythm. In a way, we might think of feeling being centered in the chest organs, the breathing and the circulation. And I'll have a lot more to say about that as we go, but that's something you might wanna just keep in mind here that maybe working with feeling problems like anxiety and so forth, this is not just something in the brain that has to do more with the organ processes. Coming from the perspective of Chinese medicine, I think this makes a lot of sense. We talk about the emotions and the different organs, not the brain. In fact, the brain is not highly discussed in Chinese medicine. It's seen like it was in ancient Greece as more of a secondary organ not a primary organ system here. Um, so thinking, feeling, willing really are not just all centered in the brain, only thinking is really part of the nervous system. Um, and then the feeling element comes in through the rhythms and then the willing element in your metabolic forces. So when we speak about the soul life and we get into mental health conditions, this becomes maybe helpful for giving us a more holistic understanding of how to work with them. Finally, I mentioned this uh, interesting research looking at biophotons, uh, the inner light of nerves. Um, and Fritz Albert Popp, who was uh, the first to kind of demonstrate the coherent nature, he worked, uh, he took older observations, for example, the Russian Gervich had, had noticed that organisms emit light um, in usually ultraviolet range. And Pop found a similar thing in uh, nerve tissue and other tissues and developed very specialized cameras to, to measure this. And he found the light was very organized and probably depended on the microtubules. Um, uh, there's also evidence that DNA itself is an interesting antenna that can receive specific electromagnetic frequencies. And so we can think of DNA as tuning ourselves to a light field um, in this way. Um, there, I mentioned there's an interesting theory of consciousness called ORC-OR, Orchestrated Objective Reduction. Um, and that is uh, been proposed by the physicist Roger Penrose, who was uh, the mentor to Stephen Hawking, and then um, Stuart Hameroff, who's an anesthesiologist down in, uh, I believe, Arizona. And um, they argue that consciousness, ar consciousness arises from quantum activities in the neurons using light. Um, so not just the electrical activities of the nerves. In fact, they argue the electrical system is just more of a primitive uh, secondary effect. It's not the primary effect of the nerves. That said, in most of neurophysiology today, we focus on the electrical phenomena. And so that's kind of where the research is. But I think maybe in the coming century, we'll see 
more, uh, more and more going on with the, the inner light activity. Um, there is some interesting experimental evidence. So a lot of these hypotheses sound nice, but again, one of the distinguishing criteria, criteria between science and pseudoscience is that in science, you can actually falsify something. You can show, hey, it's not true. You can measure something, you can show either it's true or not true. And um, uh, pseudoscience, though, you can't really falsify it. Uh, it might be true, might not be true, just what you believe. Um, so it's um, in the uh, uh, ORC-OR, there's actually some good experimental evidence now uh, that support, they made some predictions based on this theory about what they should observe in neurons, and they found it was actually true. So um, this, this is uh, something we might see develop more and more in the coming decades. Um, I mentioned that acupuncture, um, there's a lot of research going on looking at the connection between acupuncture and the nervous system. And um, I just, uh, for example, put one example of an article here uh, from um, the Journal of Acupuncture and Meridian Studies, JAMS 2010, um, looking at uh, this so-called neural hypothesis that basically it's the nerves that were influencing especially the autonomic nerves with uh, needling. So a good example of that is needling stomach 36. Um, it actually activates the vagus nerve and uh, that can increase the activity of the vagus in the stomach, for instance, to increase stomach acid secretion. That would increase pancreatic enzyme secretion in the pancreas um, and so forth. And that would all support this uh, dig upper digestive activity. Um, so that's um, one thing you might see as we go forward. So that's why I, I do emphasize the nervous system a lot um, in uh, the kind of integrative biosciences here. Okay, let's get back to some of the more anatomy and physiology of the nervous system. So let's start with the central nervous system. Again, that's the brain and spinal cord. And there's about 100 billion neurons that are packed in there. Um, this is our sort of center organizing organ. Um, the spinal cord itself enters the skull through the so-called foramen magnum. That's the big hole at the bottom of the sc uh, skull in the occipital bone. And then we have the vertebral column, which encases the spinal cord. So it has its own little protective covering. Um, both the brain and spinal cord are surrounded by the meninges. Uh, the meninges are a three-layered structure consisting of the pia mater, which is a very thin film right up against the neural tissue, the brain and spinal cord. The arachnoid, which that means spider, looks like a spider web gossamer on top of the pia. And what's interesting is that between the arachnoid and the pia is where the cerebral spinal fluid circulates. So both the brain and spinal cord are bathed in cerebral spinal fluid. In fact, the brain itself is floating in cerebral spinal fluid. And if it weren't for that fluid, um, it's very interesting, the brain itself would crush the very delicate blood vessels at the base of the brain. Um, so just like you throw something in water and because of the buoyancy, same thing happens. So it's a very interesting notion how the brain almost like is in its own little observatory here in the CSF. Uh, and then the dura mater is the tough outer layer um, between the uh, arachnoid and then the skull or the uh, vertebrae. So that's the three layered meninges, we call that the PAD, Pia Arachnoidura. Um, and then there is the blood brain barrier, which is basically a wrapping of astrocytes, one of those neuroglia cells around the capillaries in the brain. And that's gonna prevent, they basically filter out most everything that transfers from the blood to the central nervous system. So both the meninges and the blood brain barrier really separate the CNS from the body. I mentioned that the, um, in the central nervous system, there are no true nerves, but there are tracks or pathways. And these are groups of axons traveling. Um, so um, a big one you might know of already, we'll look at this when we look at the brain, is the corpus callosum. And that is um, basically a structure that connects the right and the left cerebral hemispheres. And that's a bunch of tracks, millions of axons um, that are traveling back and forth. Um, a commissure is, uh, give, is the name given to any tracks that connect the right and the left halves of the C CSF. Uh, so you see when the spinal cord here actually, this is a cross section on the right of the spinal cord, you see what's called gray matter on the outside. And we'll see that what gray matter mostly is, is um, uh, cell bodies of neural glia and uh, neurons. And then white matter, this is mostly the myelinated axons. Um, 
and um, you see here there's a commissure that connects the right and the left halves here. Um, there are groups of cell bodies uh, in the central nervous system, and these are called nuclei. Now this is complicated because we think of a nucleus usually as that part inside the cell that contains the DNA and, and so forth. That's not what a nucleus means in the nerve terminology. A nucleus or a nuclei in nerve terminology, plural, really refers to a group of nerve cell bodies. And um, so that's where the whole soma, which includes the nucleus of the cell, but also all the other stuff inside the cell uh, are found. So I'll show you examples as we uh, go through the structures in the nervous system of nuclei. Now the peripheral nervous system is again, all the nerves outside the brain and spinal cord. There are, uh, I mentioned the cranial nerves. There are 12 pairs of those, 12 on each side of the body. Um, and their cell bodies are found in the brain stem and then they send axons out to the nerves. Um, because they're found outside the central nervous system, the majority of them, we, we call them nerves. And then there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. They come out from the um, spine. And um, these each have a sensory and a motor branch. And so that's what innervates all of your muscles and so forth. Um, we further divide the peripheral nervous system again into somatic nervous system. That's the so-called voluntary nervous system. And we divide that into afferent nerves. Those are your sensory nerves that bring information from your sensory receptors like touch and pressure back to the spinal cord. And then efferent nerves, which conduct information out from the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord to your skeletal muscles. That's the voluntary uh, or somatic nervous system. And then the second division is the autonomic nervous system or involuntary. And there are both, again, afferent nerves in the autonomic. These are usually called visceral sensory nerves. And they're interesting because what they're actually doing is sensing the um, activity of your organs. Um, they're looking for pH changes, pressure changes, uh, acid base, uh, I just mentioned that, oxygenation levels, all those different things in the organs and bringing that information back to the central nervous system. So I think I already mentioned the vagus nerve and how it um, is part of that. Uh, there's a sensory part of the vagus nerve. And then the efferent division of the um, autonomics would be the uh, nerves that go out to smooth muscle, like in the you know, heart wall, the uh, smooth muscle lining your airways and your blood vessels, and so on and so forth. Um, we further divide that autonomic system into sympathetic, which is fight or flight. So that mediates your immediate stress responses. And we're gonna have a lot to say about the fight or flight nervous system. I'll just say here that the primary neurotransmitter that the sympathetics use is norepinephrine, norepi. Um, in the United States, we call, we, we call it epinephrine or norepinephrine. In Britain, they would call it noradrenaline. So adrenaline, epinephrine are the same thing. Um, the norepinephrine is what's secreted by the sympathetic nerves. Uh, epinephrine is secreted by your adrenal gland, and that's going to be, that's the same thing that's in an EpiPen, and that's super important for, again, maintaining the stress response, but we use that in, for example, anaphylaxis to basically open up your airways and your lungs, kickstart your heart, and then uh, get your blood pressure up if the blood pressure has fallen too much. Um, so that's the sympathetic, and then the parasympathetic rest and digest that is, uh, of course, regulating all of your digestive activity, and that works very closely with the enteric nervous system that I spoke about before. So that's your digestive nervous system. All right, um, so I mentioned nerves are usually bundles of thousands of axons. Um, now, what's interesting about nerves is they actually, sometimes the bigger ones like the sciatic nerve or the femoral nerve, actually have their own circulatory system. They have connective tissue and so forth. Um, by definition, a nerve fiber, you should know this, is a single axon. So that's if you took out one of those axons, almost like a single wire, uh, that would be uh, a nerve fiber. Um, a ganglia, uh, or ganglion, singular, is a mass of, if this is the equivalent in the peripheral nervous system of the nuclei that I talked about, or the nucleus, basically it's cell bodies. So the soma of the nerves are concentrated in ganglia. And there's one good example of that. If you look at the spinal cord, if you look just outside of it, you'll see these two little connecting 
uh, piers and then you see a little lump here and then the spinal nerve goes out. The spinal nerve has a motor division and that's coming out through, so this is actually the back side, this is dorsal, and this is the front side, this is ventral. Um, and you can see a bigger picture of that. Here's the uh, vertebral column, here's the spinous process on the back, so that's pointing towards your back, dorsal side, and then this is ventral side. Um, and then the spinal cord is tucked in there. And these little ganglia are actually inside the vertebrae so that you can't see them easily unless you open up the vertebrae. But basically, you have motor impulses that come out this way, and then sensory impulses travel along the same nerve, and they come into the central nervous system here. But the cell body of the sensory neuron is concentrated in what's called the dorsal root ganglion. And so the dorsal root ganglia are actually the places where the cell bodies are located. A couple of other little terms. So enteric plexuses are networks of nerves, neurons, uh, located in the walls of organs. So in the GI tract, for example, um, there are a number of collections of nerves, uh, the cell bodies, and they send out different branches to different parts. So that's part of the uh, enteric nervous system and they are super important for regulating digestion. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, and then of course sensory receptors are needed as I mentioned to sort of monitor the local environment. So there are ones for temperature, for pressure, for touch, um, chemical sensations. Some of the nerve endings are just free nerve endings. Uh, you see that a lot and like I said the pain receptors and things like that. So these are some of the basic structures in the PNS. So I mentioned that the uh, enteric nervous system at the intestines could be thought of as a second brain. Um, and this has received a lot more attention in the last couple of decades as we sort of mapped out the complexity of this system. And we'll go into much more detail in uh, the gastrointestinal section. But there are several layers to this uh, gut intestine, uh, intestinal nervous system. And um, in particular, what we're finding is that not only does the nervous system regulate the motor activity, the so-called peristalsis of the gut, but the nerves are intimately involved in sensing the inner environment of the intestines. And that would include the um, sort of composition of the microbiome, all the intestinal bacteria, which uh, we know that the microbiome in the intestines, the lungs, the skin, really outnumbers the bacteria, the number of cells in your body by about 10 to one. So it's an enormous uh, load of uh, organisms. But the uh, enteric nervous system is partly responsible for sensing that environment, conveying that information up to the brain. So there's now a lot of talk about the so-called gut-brain access, <clears throat> about how the gut activity is gonna infect the brain. And that goes back to this sort of idea that a lot of mental health disorders um, like depression and so forth are not really centered in the brain, but really have a, uh, are involved with different organs in the body. Um, one other thing I'll say about the sensory system in the gut, so these little sensory neurons here on the inner gut lining um, are also detecting, we've actually found that there are taste receptors, not just on the tongue, but all throughout the gut lining. We've also found that there are olfactory smell receptors all throughout the gut lining. So when you swallow uh, an herbal mixture, um, we can say that those sensory receptors are picking up on the different molecular shapes that are in that concoction. And that's triggering the nerves and having direct effects on the vagus nerve and whatnot, and the rest of the body. So it's very interesting that just by uh, sensing the different molecules in these uh, concoctions, we can have profound effects on the nervous system, which would then change the activity of different organs almost instantaneously. So it wouldn't be that this, you know, your herbal mixture has to get into the blood and then has to travel around to the organs. It can actually work through the nervous system very quickly. So this is maybe a second way that um, uh, remedies like herbal therapies, but we also suspect this is the same with drug therapies, can communicate with uh, the body. Um, <clears throat> there is also a nervous system, as I mentioned earlier, around the heart, and we call that the cardiac plexus, and there are both sensory and motor neurons there that regulate the heart rate and rhythm, uh, but also sense the pressure of the blood in the chambers of the heart, and that's tied in with hormones that the heart actually secretes. So the heart is actually a hormone-secreting organ, we now know, that communicates with the kidneys, and that helps regulate the fluid volume and blood pressure through these hormones. Um, but the cardiac nervous system is tied in with that as well. 
Um, so these sort of peripheral little brains around the body are interesting because they're regulating all the underlying activity. If we line them all up, what's interesting is that if you get a picture this way, if you look at the uh, hypothalamus pituitary, there is a cervical plexus around the thyroid, the cardiac plexus around the heart, the celiac plexus just below the diaphragm, which regulates your stomach, your liver, your pancreas, your spleen. Um, there's a mesenteric plexus and then pelvic plexus. <clears throat> These nerve plexi really line up around the old chakra system. And um, this is um, you know, another interesting correlation with the more traditional ideas that these seven centers really are at the seat of regulating. If you put another one up here with your pineal gland, these seven centers are at the seat of regulating all of your internal activities. Um, I'll, I'll mention this in connection with the uh, extraordinary vessels here in just a little bit, but uh, that's where these peripheral nervous systems uh, may play a role. Now, just as I mentioned, there are three fundamental processes in the body, the form activities, the metabolic activities, and then the rhythmical activities that maintain the balance. Um, and they're roughly situated in the three poles of the body. So the nerve activity more towards the upper pole, the metabolic activities more down towards the lower pole, and then the rhythmical activities in the center of the chest. Well, although the nerve activity is concentrated in the upper pole, it actually has a threefold division as well. So we can say that the true upper pole is the central nervous system, specifically the brain. And again, that's surrounded by the meninges and there's a blood brain barrier. Um, and then there's a middle domain of the nervous system more in the chest and that would be where your spinal nerves come out your 31 pairs of spinal nerves that's part of your peripheral nervous system I put the cranial nerves here but of course they're more part of the head but you know they're they're part of the peripheral nervous system by definition um, and these are outside the blood-brain barrier outside the meninges and they regulate your voluntary muscles but also your reflexes so we might think of the upper domain with the brain is more part of your conscious nervous system um, the reflexes are more kind of subconscious you sort of feel a reflex but you're not having to consciously think about it um, the sympathetic nervous system also originates here from the middle pole and um, so that's again regulating this inner feeling life so in the kind of feeling element in the muscles and your sympathetics that's that's an image of that feeling activity and then finally, there's a lower division of the nervous system, <clears throat> and that would be your parasympathetics and enterics. And they relate directly to your digestive organs, <clears throat> your inner metabolism, and uh, all of those substantive activities that I spoke about earlier. So that's the threefold uh, division of the nerve activity. Now, we come to embryology. Embryology is a very complex subject that actually deserves a whole couple of weeks just on itself, and uh, maybe at the end of the series we'll get a chance to do that. Um, but I'll just very quickly summarize <clears throat> the embryological development. It's interesting because it almost goes on a weekly basis. So after fertilization, week one, there's a very specific activities that happen. Week two, another set of activities. Week three, week four, etc. Up to week eight, and that's the end of what's called the embryonic period. That's weeks one through eight after fertilization. And then after the embryonic period is the fetal period. And that's basically just growing what's already been laid down in the first eight weeks. So it's really the first eight weeks, first two months, um, that is most significant for laying down all the organ plans and, and everything else. And that's why the fetus, just as an aside, is most susceptible to so-called teratogens or compounds that can affect embryologic development in that first eight weeks. Uh, so things like alcohol and cigarette smoke and things like that. <clears throat> um, after that, in the fetal period, the, um, the fetus is more resilient to those kinds of things. So in the first eight weeks, uh, first, let's just talk about the first two weeks of development here. You know, we start with uh, fertilization. And uh, that's where the, you know, the egg, which has the half the number of normal chromosomes, 23, comes together with the sperm also with 23 chromosomes to give us the total complement of 46 uh, chromosomes. And um, so that um, is going to form a structure known as the zygote. And this process of fertilization is typically happening in the fallopian tube. So ovulation has expelled the egg from the ovary and then the sperm have come up and they're going to meet the egg somewhere in the fallopian tube. 
course, that can happen anywhere along the fallopian tube. Unfortunately, sometimes it can happen even outside, and that can create what's called an ectopic pregnancy. Um, but assuming everything goes normal here, the zygote forms, and then it undergoes a process called cleavage in that first week, where the single cell uh, now splits into two cells, then four cells, then eight cells, um, all the while not growing. So this structure actually is bound by a glycoprotein layer to prevent it from growing. And um, so it's really undergoing cleavage and what's called compaction. So it's getting more compacted and eventually forms this structure called the morula, which is a very compactive grape-like structure um, with all these little cells. Now, as another aside here, these cells are all stem cells. These are called uh, totipotent stem cells. So if you take a single one of these cells, it can form an entire new uh, uh, embryo and uh, as well as placenta um, and uh, surrounding tissues. Um, so these are called totipotent uh, stem cells. As we'll see, as cells undergo a process of differentiation over time, they become more and more specialized, less and less able to make a whole organism. Um, so anyways, in the morula, we have the, um, the uh, totipotent stem cells. Uh, one further aside, the morula can actually be removed at this stage. <clears throat> you know, if this process of fertilization happened outside the body, in the test tube, it can be frozen, and uh, then it can be reimplanted later. Um, some animals, like uh, deer, actually uh, take the morula and they uh, prevent it from growing further for several months so that once it starts to undergo the, the further development, the developing doe, when it's born, will actually, uh, or fawn, I guess, uh, will actually be born at a time when there's better food resources and whatnot. So the morula is very mineral-like. It can be sort of stored, frozen, can undergo what's called embryopause, it can stop growing temporarily, and so forth. Anyways, the morula is going to become, undergo a further division into what's called the blastocyst, where you start developing a little cavity inside and then a little group of cells at one pole. And interestingly, the entire new embryo is gonna grow from that blob of cells. The other pole here with the empty cavity, this is gonna eventually form the uh, placenta, the amnion, and all the surrounding tissues. Um, this blastocyst is gonna implant then in the uterine wall. And usually this happens towards the end of the first week. Then it's going to sort of grow inside into the uterine wall. That's not shown in this picture here. And it's going to undergo further development. And this inner group of cells is going to eventually split into two cells, two layers of cells. And then by the third week, it's going to split into three layers of cells. Um, and these are what are known as the three primary germ layers. And what's interesting about that is that every tissue in your body will be formed from these three prim primary germ layers. So Here's another interesting image of this threefoldness that <clears throat> these are your three primary um, tissue layers. And those three layers are the ectoderm, um, and that's going to form, that's what you see in blue here. Um, that's the ectoderm. The endoderm is going to be connected to what's called the yolk sac, and that's going to eventually become your intestines and your metabolic activity. And then the mesoderm is in red, that's in between. Um, the, endo, the ectoderm is going to form your entire nervous system. So that's, gonna, that's interesting because that forms first. And then from there, the other layers are formed. Um, and this process is known as gastrulation. And we'll, like I said, we can go into this a lot more detail later. But basically, the three primary germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, form all of your other tissues. And I've just sort of um, put in a table here, you don't need to memorize this, uh, the different tissues formed from each layer. <clears throat> so... Again, the ectoderm forms the nervous system, and that would include the central and peripheral nervous system, but also the epidermis of the skin. And this is very interesting from the perspective of acupuncture, that the skin, we can say, is a direct way of communicating with the nervous system, <clears throat> versus the gut lining is a direct way of communicating with your metabolic organs. So by doing acupuncture, we're directly communicating with the nervous system uh, in different ways. By applying salt baths or anything to the skin, you're gonna affect, you're gonna communicate with the nervous system in a specific way. Um, your sensory organs like the eye and the ear and so forth also form from the ectoderm. We say these are the organs that separate us from the environment. So your entire nervous system, uh, the epidermis of the skin, including the melanocytes, which give the 
uh, skin color. <clears throat> the um, epithelium of your mouth and nasal cavity, as well as your salivary glands, glands of the mouth, and so forth. Um, your pineal gland and pituitary gland up in the brain, and then the adrenal medulla, which is what secretes the epinephrine slash adrenaline. Um, that also forms from ectoderm. Your tooth enamel <clears throat> forms from ectoderm, uh, and um, the pulp as well in the teeth, and then uh, sense organs, I mentioned the eye and the ear. Um, so that's all ectodermal tissue. Just very quickly, the endoderm, on the other hand, forms the epithelial lining of your digestive tract. And so that's going to eventually form your whole you know, inner lining of the GI tract. Of course, the GI tract has nerves, and that's going to come from the ectoderm. Um, but the inner lining that's from endoderm, that also will form the liver and gallbladder, pancreas, tonsils, uh, as well as the lung epithelium. So the inner lining of the lungs, and that's important because... Uh, you know, the lungs can be seen really as an expression of the GI tract. Um, and so a lot of lung disorders are actually connected with GI problems. And we see that clinically all the time where we say phlegm, mucus in the intestines. We see the same thing in the respiratory tract. Um, <clears throat> and then um, the uh, urogenital system, um, the bladder itself, prostate, the vagina, and then egg and sperm also come from endoderm. The um, uh, Tympanic membrane, the auditory tube in the ear comes from endoderm, and then thyroid gland, parathyroid, thymus. These are, again, you don't need to memorize this, but all of these, you can say, have a connection with your digestive apparatus. And then in between is the mesoderm, and that's going to develop into your muscle, all your connective tissue, as well as heart and kidneys. Um, so that is your kind of middle system. And uh, this is, again, related more to that rhythmical element. So the muscles of the lungs, the muscles of the intestines, all that comes from mesoderm. <clears throat> um, so it gets a little complicated because, again, organs are made of all these different tissues. Um, but um, those are the three layers. So the nervous system in particular is arising from the endoderm, uh, the ectoderm. Now, right after the three primary germ layers develop, there's a process known as neurulation that occurs. And so this might be a little confusing because again, trying to visualize embryology, you gotta think three-dimensionally and it's kind of hard with all these structures. But what you see at the right here is actually the sheet of ectoderm and here's underlying mesoderm and they're not showing the endoderm, which is underneath there. And you have the structure going up and down called the nototube, uh, the notochord, I'm sorry, and then uh, these two big blobs of mesoderm here. Well, what's going to happen is this uh, ectoderm is going to move, start moving inwards, and it's going to actually move down and pinch itself off, and it's going to create a tube inside. And so by the end of the third week of development, what you're going to find is the uh, embryo is going to start to look a little bit worm-like with a tube here going up and down the length of the embryo called the neural tube. Uh, and uh, then outside of the neural tube, we're going to see uh, different tissues. Uh, we'll, we'll look at those called the neurocrest cells. But basically, it's from the neural tube that the entire nervous system develops, uh, the central nervous system. And then from the neural crest, we start to see the peripheral nervous system develop. Um, here's the same picture. So the, at the beginning of the third week with the three primary germ layers, the embryo is actually kind of an oval flat shape. And then the neurulation occurs. So we're looking down onto the embryo. So here's the ectoderm here. Here's mesoderm. Here's endoderm. This is going to move downwards and it's going to eventually pinch off and form the neural tube. Um, and then it's going to kind of zipper its way up. Um, and notice that the two ends here of the embryo, one's going to be correlating to where the head's going to form, the other where the tail is, are the last to zipper. Of course, if that zippering doesn't happen, we get something called uh, spina bifida. And that can actually happen at either end. If it happens at the head end, you create what's called anencephaly. There's no head that develops and that uh, fetus will not survive. But there's different degrees of spina bifida where this closes to various degrees, and that might need a surgical correction if it's severe enough. Um, so that's the neural tube development and the development of the nervous system. So uh, neural crest, again, it's not really shown in these pictures. It's actually located right outside of the neural tube. 
Uh, so the neural tube is going to give rise to the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, and then the neural crest will give rise to the peripheral uh, nervous system, especially the uh, parasympathetic, the enterics, and the uh, sympathetic nerves. So that's going to be um, kind of the laying down the organization of the nervous system. So again, that's a lot of information very quickly, and so it can be very difficult to kind of visualize all this. But the reason I wanted to bring this up is that, again, by the end of the um, third week of development, um, the embryo in cross-section kind of looks like a worm, and it's going to really have three tubes. So it's going to be surrounded by an amniotic cavity. Um, so you see down here in this picture. And there's going to be a neural tube. There is uh, a gut tube, which is going to become your intestines. That's part of the endodermal tissue. And then in the middle part of the mesoderm is another tube, and that's going to be the future aorta. Um, so three tubes in cross-section. And where that's interesting is if you study meridian theory, um, there is this idea that comes from the Nanjing um, that prior to the 12 acupuncture meridians, there are eight extraordinary vessels that form. And in fact, three of those are primary of the eight, and that is the so-called Dumai, the Renmai, and the Chongmai. And what's very interesting is if you look at the pathway of the Dumai, um, that correlates exactly with where the sp spinal cord and the brain develop. So we could correlate the Dumai with the neural tube. Um, and what's further interesting about that is that the Nanjing states that the uh, Dumai is going to actually give rise to all of the Yang acupuncture meridians, so all six Yang meridians. And that correlates with your Fu or hollow organs. So your stomach, small intestine, large intestine, gallbladder, bladder, and oop, triple burner, uh, triple burner. Um, so if you look at these organs, it's interesting because the stomach is, you know, smooth muscle. It has endothelium, epithelium on the inside, but it also is very nerve rich. Um, and same with the small and large intestine. Again, that's that enteric nervous system. Gallbladder also, the whole biliary tract. And again, in Chinese medicine, when they say gallbladder, they're not just talking about that little sac below the liver, but the entire biliary tree. And uh, that is smooth muscle, and it's innervated by parasympathetic nerves and enteric nerves. Uh, same with bladder. So these Fu organs are very, very highly nerve innervated, and I think that's interesting. So we can think that really in Chinese medicine, although we don't explicitly talk about the nervous system in a lot of detail, we do talk about these six yang meridians, and they could very well be seen as correlates to the nerve activity. So when we talk about the vagus nerve in biomedicine, we might be talking about stomach in um, uh, the stomach meridian in Chinese medicine. So needling the stomach meridian would activate the vagus nerve. Activating the gallbladder meridian might very well activate, and again, we have some experimental evidence for this, the biliary tree and the nerve activity there. Um, on the other hand, the gut tube really correlates with, um, you know, that's where the intestines develop. And the renmai, which runs up the front of the body over the abdomen, really correlates with that. And that's the source of all of your yin meridians. Um, your solid organs like your spleen, the heart, the lungs, liver, kidney, pericardium. So these organs are, um, you'd say, not as nerve rich, interestingly. So the liver has nerves, for instance, but it's not as nerve rich as the gallbladder. Uh, and so forth. So they're more metabolic organs, metabolic rich. So that's more representative of that yin metabolic blood pole versus the neural tube, the du mai yang meridians more are the qi, um, kind of the yang uh, nerve pole of activity. And then in between we have the chong mai, which is the sea of blood, which is essentially the aorta and that whole uh, cardiovascular structure. So Curiously, that you know that this the Nanjing describes these three primary tubes. Again, this embryo, if you're to look at it, is basically about an eighth of an inch long. Um, this is not really visible. So how this was known? This was not known through physical observation. Uh, this was known through some sort of other perception, and uh, just but really, really strong and interesting correlations here. Uh, one final note I'll say is that if you look at the um, you know, the body plan. The yang meridians all come from start on the hands, end on the face, or start on the face, end on the feet. 
So you can say they are essentially representing forces coming down um, versus the yin meridians either start on the toes, I'll draw it in red here, start on the toes, end on the chest, or start on the chest, end on the hands. So we can say they represent this arrow coming up. So we can say one is more cosmic information, sensory information, maybe thoughts on another level, uh, conscious and unconscious, coming down, uh, being picked up by the nerve tissue, by the yang meridians, and then the substantive pole coming more from the earth, your food and all of the nutrition is coming up, streaming up to those yin meridians. Um, so this will tie in with what I said earlier that, you know, if the nerve activity uh, goes too far, we start to have overshaping of the body, sclerosis. So we can think there's, that's too much yang activity versus if the yin activity gets the upper hand, then we have more of that acute inflammatory element. We lose form, get more of the living substance that's involved there. And um, so we can think about how to maybe use acupuncture versus using yin and yang meridians uh, to treat those. So that's one really curious correlation we have between uh, biomedical embryology and uh, Chinese medicine. Here's just one more way of visualizing that. Here's the pathway of the uh, du mai, the governing vessel, up the back of the body, goes up the top of the head and, and ends on the uh, upper lip, starts down at the base and the perineum. Um, this is, again, we can think of that correlating with the neural tube, the nerve activity, the yang activity, and what I talked about earlier as the formative processes. But again, the old alchemists referred to as the salting activity, or in Chinese medicine referred to, of course, as yang. Um, so that is uh, the uh, governing vessel, and that correlates with the yang meridians, stomach, large intestine, bladder, um, uh, you know, you can think of bladder actually as having two, an upper and a lower, I'll go into that later, um, and then gallbladder, small intestine. Triple warm is interesting because, again, if you've heard various discussions about that in Chinese medicine, that's often related to the lymphatic system, uh, etc. I actually, and I'll be trying to make a case for this later, the triple burner, when I see patients with triple burner uh, imbalance, those are patients that typically have imbalances in their hypothalamus with the so-called HPA, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access. They have cortisol dysregulation or with their thyroid dysregulation or their ovary or um, testes dysregulation. And so um, this... Um, I would correlate the triple warmer very strongly with the hypothalamus pituitary. So I'll come back to that, but um, that could give us some interesting insight down the road. So these would be the yang meridians. Now, in the future, I'm going to come back to this and go one step further and say, could we relate? So again, the primary signaling molecule of the nervous system are neurotransmitters. Could we relate each yang meridian with a neurotransmitter? And the answer is, I think you can. And uh, that actually uh, allows us to make a lot of different correlations with biomedicine. So again, we'll be coming back to that one. On the other hand, we have the yin meridians with the conception vessel. These are the more metabolic processes, which again, in the language of alchemy was the sulfur activity. And um, this is uh, correlated with your yin meridians. Now, I mentioned that homeostasis, the forces that maintain our inner balance, is maintained primarily by the nervous and the endocrine systems. Again, you can throw the immune system in there too. Uh, but nervous and endocrine, so we just talked about the nerves. The endocrine system is coming through the blood. It's synthesized by these endocrine organs. And also many of the organs like the liver and the heart also put, and the kidneys put out hormones. So we might think of each of these yin meridians is correlating with an endocrine gland. So a very strong correlation, for example, is spleen with pancreas. And uh, we'll be coming back to that one a lot. Um, and lung with, interestingly, thyroid. If you look at thyroid insufficiency in the biomedical sense, the classic symptoms are fatigue, uh, you know, pallor, uh, dry skin, constipation, low immunity. If you look at lung qi deficiency in Chinese medicine, it's fatigue, pallor, constipation, dry skin, low immunity. So in a sense, they're exactly describing the same internal patterns. We just now have a hormone we can attach it to, whereas the Chinese uh, related that to the lung system in general.
uh, and so forth. So, um, you know, this is one way of sort of making a very strong biomedical correlation to say that these higher level processes that were discussed in Chinese medicine really um, could be seen as having an image in matter so that the neurotransmitters, the hormones that we see that we measure biomedically are images of the activity discussed as qi and blood and so forth in Chinese medicine. For example, kidney yang deficiency, if you look at those symptoms, they correlate almost precisely with what we describe as low testosterone states. Uh, so seeing that testosterone is not necessarily the same as kidney yang, but it is a carrier in the material sense of the kidney yang activity. So this is how, again, we can start connecting maybe what we're talking about in the energetic sense with Chinese medicine, subtle energy sense, with the more material sense that we focus on uh, in biomedicine. All right, so that is the, uh, the two poles here, the nerve sensory and the metabolic. All right, in the final little section here, I just want to kind of look at the um, structure of neurons and neuroglia. So I mentioned that neurons, let's start with that, have a cell body called a soma. And the soma is what contains the nucleus. It also contains the ribosomes. You remember ribosomes are where proteins are synthesized once the genes are uh, transcribed. And, um, and then we make RNA and that goes to the ribosomes and then we make proteins. Um, and then mitochondria also are found here in the soma. Um, branching off the soma, we have dendrites, like little trees. Um, and uh, some neurons actually have up to 40, 400,000 dendrites. So it's a huge number. And then each dendrite further, and I'll show you a picture of this, has little projections called dendritic spines, which increases the surface area of the dendrite. Basically, if you look at the dendrites on a molecular level, their cell surfaces are covered with um, uh, receptors for different neurotransmitters. And so when, for example, serotonin, the abbreviation for serotonin is 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine, comes in, it can, if there's a serotonin receptor here, it'll bind to that receptor, and that will start a little electrical current called the graded potential here in the dendrite. Now, let's say maybe dopamine, DA, over here, binds to its receptor, if there's a receptor for it. That might start another current over here. All these currents will sum together. Now, as we'll see, it's more complicated because some of the currents are more stimulatory, some are more inhibitory. But they basically all are gonna flow over the soma, sum together in this region called the axon hillock. And the axon hillock is important because if the certain electrical potential is reached at that region, it will trigger what's called an action potential to fire along the axon. Um, so the axon is this long thread here, and we see in this picture it's surrounded by these little blobs of myelin. Um, myelin is kind of hard to visualize in that direction. You really need to look at it in cross section. So if here's an axon, myelin is basically like a layer of, uh, it's almost like a bun around a hot dog, uh, layers of fatty insulation. So nerves use a lot of fat. There's different types of uh, fatty acids. For example, uh, phosphatidylserine. Uh, cholesterol uh, is actually used a lot in nerve insulation and so forth. So this um, uh, myelin is actually going to help, almost like an insulation around a wire, allow that action potential con to conduct along the axon and uh, without dissipating. Now, there's little gaps in the, in the myelin. And if you zoom in on that gap, what you see here is if this is the axon, and here's myelin, there's a little gap in the myelin right here where the axon cell membrane can actually make contact with the body fluids and the electrolytes that are around here. And this is called a node of Ranvier. And these are important, um, node of Ranvier. Uh, these are important because um, it's going to allow the action potential to recharge at each point. And we'll look at that in detail in the next lecture. So that is uh, the, the myelin in the axon. And then at the end of the neuron, we have these little collaterals, so it, the uh, axon branches, and then these little terminal buttons, also known as synaptic bulbs, um, at the end. And if you zoom in on the synaptic bulb, so it looks like that, there are little packages of neurotransmitter that are stored in here. 
And so when the action potential comes down, what's going to happen is it's going to open up a little channel for calcium ions to flow in. They will cause the uh, little bundle of neurotransmitter to bind to the cell membrane of the synaptic bulb and then dump the neurotransmitter uh, into the little synaptic space. And usually there's another receiving neuron down here. So this would be the postsynaptic neuron. Um, and then the whole process starts over again. So that's, um, that's how neurons are interconnected. And so these are the typical structures. Um, another name for these little branches are called teleodendria uh, at the end of an axon. So just some terms to be familiar with, and uh, we'll be seeing that as we go. I mentioned that it's the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, which wrap myelin around the axons. Uh, and then in the peripheral nervous system, it's the Schwann cells. And the nodes of Ranvier are the little spaces that allow the um, uh, axon membrane to be exposed to the surrounding extracellular fluid. And that's going to be important for uh, allowing the nerve conduction to happen properly. Uh, the neurolemma is the uh, tight covering around the myelin uh, formed by the cell membrane of the Schwann cell. And this is important because this is going to in the peripheral nervous system provide for the potential of regeneration of those nerves. I mentioned that nerves don't really regrow if they're injured. There's some exceptions in the peripheral nervous system. If you cut an axon, but the cell body remains alive um, and the Schwann cell is still intact, the cell body can shoot a new axon down the channel that's left by that Schwann cell. And um, so this, this can allow for regeneration. And that's where nerves can regrow, usually very slowly, maybe a couple of millimeters every couple of weeks. And um, so if you damage a long nerve, like in your leg, some of these sensory nerves come, go from your big toe, for example, all the way up to your spinal cord. That's a single axon. And if you damage that axon somewhere maybe halfway along the way, um, the cell body of that sensory nerve is actually up in the dorsal root ganglion up in the spinal cord, as I mentioned earlier, it can shoot down a new axon along that channel. And that's where the neurolemma is important for that. A couple of little more technical terms. Um, you know, this is just helpful to know when you read some of the neurological literature. We can classify neurons based on what's called polarity. And that's basically looking at how their axons and dendrites relate. So if you look at um, a classic multipolar neuron, what you have here is one axon, so that's a number three here. Um, one axon with, uh, here's one axon with this little teleodendry at the end, with a soma and then multiple dendrites branching from that soma. That's a multipolar neuron. Um, all motor neurons are multipolar. And so there's different types, for example, Golgi 1 and Golgi 2 are specific types of motor neurons. We'll see those are in different parts of the brain and the um, uh, cerebellum. Um, so those would be examples of multipolar neurons. Bipolar neurons, which you see in 2, is where the, there's one axon and one dendrite. And uh, the soma is right in between. So that's bipolar. And that's found in cells like in the retina, inner ear, olfactory area. So these are sensory neurons. So usually the dendrites are covered in different sensory receptors. They send the information towards the soma. And then if there's enough of a signal, it creates an action potential. And then it goes the other direction. Um, unipolar neurons, that's in number one, have only one branch for both axons and dendrites. So we usually have dendrites on one side and then axons on the other. So the information kind of goes that way. Um, this is typical of sensory neurons. And then uh, pseudo-unipolar, which you see in four, is pretty classic of sensory neurons in the peripheral nervous system where you have the cell body usually located in a ganglion, like in the dorsal root ganglion. Um, and then you have, you have dendrites at one end, a very long dendritic process, which then becomes an axon process. And then we have the... Uh, teleodendry at the other end, and that's where the synapses will be. So kind of the dendritic spine and the um, uh, axon are all one uh, unit here. So that is a pseudo-unipolar. And then an axonic is an axon that can't be distinguished from the dendrite. So they look exactly the same. Um, so that is uh, one way of classifying, is based on polarity. Others would be just by the name of the cells that have come up 
historically, like for example, Purkinje cells were named after the histologist Purkinje. He found them in the cerebellum. Pyramidal cells look pyramid shaped. They're found in the cerebral cortex. Uh, basket cells are found in the cerebellum because they look like baskets. Bet cells, again, were named after histologists. These are large motor neurons. Granule cells, they have little granules, and then anterior horn cells based in the spinal cord. So you'll see those names as well. A lot of it's kind of arbitrary. You just have to kind of memorize it. It's, it's not that important, but um, it's helpful to know what you're talking about. And then I mentioned already the classification into afferent and efferent in interneurons. So just to kind of put this in context, 99% of neurons are interneurons. So Afferent and efferent are actually not as common, but they're extremely important. So again, afferent are primarily sensory neurons, and then um, they're usually unipolar, uh, and then the uh, uh, or the pseudo unipolar, and then the efferent neurons are the motor neurons. All right, so that's uh, some important terms to to be familiar with. So let's just look a little bit more in detail at the dendrites here. So the dendrites form a dendritic tree. And um, again, some neurons can have over 100,000, I mentioned even 400,000 uh, inputs via their dendrites. So that gives it a lot of potential complexity. Um, the upstream neurons then stimulate the dendrites via synapses. So for example, in this picture to the right, you're not seeing it, but there's a, probably another neuron here with its synapses. And just to let you know, by convention, we usually draw neurons like this with the cell body. We don't usually draw the dendrites. We just kind of assume they're there and the information's coming in. And then we draw a long axon and then we draw a synapse like this. So what you often see is pictures of little neurons interconnected like this. And that would is just as a schematic way of, of drawing that. Um, so in case you get confused when you see those little pictures. Um, so the, the dendrites, of course, are receiving the information. Usually they have uh, receptors for different neurotransmitters. And I mentioned the same neuron can have dozens of different neurotransmitter receptors in the dendrites, but it will only secrete via the uh, axon terminals one single neurotransmitter, which is why we can classify nerves based on that neurotransmitter they secrete. Um, the dendrites have a very specific electrical current called the graded potential. And again, we'll look at the differences between action and graded potential in the next lecture. Um, they also have dendritic spines, and the spines again increase the surface area. So you can see very clearly here the spines, and here's the synapse from another, uh, here's an axon coming in, here's the synapse, and the dendritic spine usually is studded with uh, receptors for different neurotransmitters. Um, these spines um, really increase the receptive properties of the dendrite. They also change a lot, so we see that they get modulated with learning and memory tasks and so forth. And I just wanna be clear that the synapses are constantly you know, changing. So let's say, going back to this picture, um, let's say we have a nerve pathway where we have one neuron synapsing onto another here. Maybe there's another neuron nearby, but it's not connected. Well, through learning, it could very well happen that um, this axon could detach, oops, find the eraser button here. Um, this axon could detach and it can reattach. It can actually move over and reattach onto this neuron. And so we form different neural circuits. Um, and so learning is really about laying down different neural circuits. So when you hear the term neuroplasticity, what people are talking about is usually these uh, breaking and reforming different uh, uh, neural circuits via the synapses. Um, so the axons, almost like little tentacles, can reconnect to different neurons. So that's a very dynamic and plastic process. So don't get the sense that the brain is just this fixed, dead thing. It's, it's constantly changing. Again, though, the cells, if you damage this neuron, if it dies, it's usually not going to regenerate. But maybe another neuron nearby here would then reconnect with its synapse and you could maybe get the new learning pathway restored. It also says that when you learn a habit, it can be very difficult to break it sometimes because you really have to break and reform all of these uh, neural pathways. And that can take time and that can take a lot of inner effort. Um, all right, here's just uh, one final little image of the dendrites. You just you see the complexity of some of them, how branched they are. Like for example, the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. Cerebellum is at the little back of the brain, which is involved in balance, um, in coordination. 
So you see these are very, have a huge number of this very rich dendritic tree, which uh, brings information in. So that's a little bit on dendrites. A few words on the soma. So again, the soma is the cell body of the neuron. It contains the nucleus, and this is where the protein synthesis, including the synthesis of different neurotransmitters, happens. Now, neurotransmitters, of course, are not secreted by the nucleus. They actually are made there, but then they're going to be transported down the axon, and we'll look at that here next, by a special little transportation system. Uh, called axonal transport, which sends the neurotransmitter down to the end of the axon where it's stored in those little vesicles waiting for secretion. Um, so this is um, the, the nucleus, though, is where all of these things are made. Um, Niesel bodies are observed when the soma is stained um, uh, histologically with a very specific type of dye. It's called a basophilic dye. And what these are really are are rough, rough endoplasmic reticulum with some of the ribosomal RNA, and these are involved in protein synthesis. So when histologists look at neurons, they see a lot of nesal bodies. That tells us that neuron is very active metabolically, or was active. Of course, when you stain it, it's dead. You're taking it out of the body. Um, but um, you know it was very active uh, metabolically. There are very structure, various structural proteins in the soma. I already mentioned the microtubules which are formed from a component called tubulin. These are made of amino acids. And uh, it's like a little tube, and it's hollow. And again, this might be a candidate for an inner light cable signaling system. Uh, and then there's actin, which is a motor protein. And then there are different neurofilaments, neurofibrils. And these allow the neuron to give it structure, but also to allow the axon to move around, like I just talked about in the last slide, how it can start to form new connections. And then there are a number of different pigments that accumulate in neurons, and they usually accumulate with age. So neuromelanin is brown and black, and lipofusion is yellow-brown. This is usually from fat, oxidized fat. Neuromelanin is usually from uh, melanin, uh, as well as other proteins that have uh, accumulated are no longer being dissolved away. We can say these are examples of that sclerotic process I talked about. And so we find a lot of... Um, uh, pigments, uh, you know, accumulating in people with a lot of neurodegenerative disease and so forth. But it happens normally. Um, there's also, interestingly, neurons also accumulate heavy metals pretty well. And so uh, we find that, you know, if you're exposed maybe at age three to some mercury, uh, that mercury will still be in your brain at 85. And um, what, what we think happens in the majority of people is that the neuron kind of walls itself off from the influence of that, and it's not a big deal. For many. For some, though, it can create a lot of neurological deficits and problems, and that actually ties in with, you know, the, the glial cells. They usually have to detoxify the environment around the neurons, and if they're not doing their job properly, then that could be an issue. Um, now, in Chinese medicine, I'll just say we talked about the organ functions, like, again, liver and kidney and so forth. Uh, they relate to the endocrine system, potentially. Um, if we have a problem in the Chinese liver, Chinese kidney, um, then we might see that that directly correlates with an inability of certain activity in the brain to occur, like certain glial cells can't clean up the mess properly. So when we say we stimulate the liver in Chinese medicine or kidney, we actually are probably also stimulating glial cell activity, uh, even though we don't have a lot of information about that yet. But clinically, I often find that I, I suspect that's what's happening when I'm treating the liver. I, we see changes in neurological function, and it could very well be because we're, we're maybe stimulating the cleanup activities of, of glial cells. And then finally, axons are the fine nerve fibers. We've talked about these already. They carry the action potentials. Um, and in the next lecture, we'll talk specifically that the axons are very rich in what are called voltage-dependent sodium channels together with specific types of potassium channels, and that's gonna allow the action potential to occur. Um, the axolemma is the cell membrane covering the axon, just a fancy name for the cell membrane of the axon, that's axolemma. Uh, the axoplasm is the cytoplasm inside the axon, and the telodendria are the ends, uh, the branches of the axon we've already talked about here. So those are the teleodendria. And then there's the axonal terminals or synaptic bulbs. Uh, and those are at the very end. And they secrete the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft.
and then we have the myelin and the gaps in the myelin called the nodes of Ronvier. Now, I should be very clear to say that not all neurons are myelinated. In fact, the myelin increases the signal conduction of the neuron. So myelinated nerves carry impulses faster than unmyelinated nerves. A good example of that is when you stub your toe, the first thing you feel is usually this, you know, you, you become conscious that you hit something. That's carried, that information is carried, that pressure information is carried by myelinated nerves up to the brain. And then maybe three, four seconds later, then the throbbing happens. And that's carried by unmyelinated nerves uh, up to the spinal cord in the brain. And uh, those unmyelinated nerves carry the pain signals. So it shows you the difference in signal conduction speed. Again, you know, even with the myelinated nerves, this is not happening at the speed of light or anything. These, there is a definite speed limit um, to uh, nerve conduction. Um, again, though, if there's some nerve signaling going on or light signaling, that could be a whole different story. But from conventional physiology, we, we, we think there's a speed limit there. Um, again, some neurons have no axons. We saw that in the previous pictures there. Um, some neurons have axons that sprout from their dendrites. And then um, no neuron has more than one axon. So you can have many, many dendrites, but only one axon maximum per neuron. Um, and we find that axonal dysfunction is found in a lot of inherited and different acquired neurological disorders. So we'll look at things like MS, which actually involves the myelin. It's an autoimmune attack or uh, inflammatory attack, at least, on the myelin sheets around um, uh, both sensory and motor neurons. Uh, ALS is a destruction of the motor neurons um, in the central nervous system and also the peripheral nervous system. Um, but these are um, different examples of axonal disorders. Uh, I mentioned axonal transport as a way that uh, you know, neurotransmitters synthesized up in the soma can get out to their terminals. So there's two ways of transport. One is going from soma to the terminals and that's called anterograde transport. Um, and that's going to carry neurotransmitters, but also even mitochondria, different membrane proteins, and so forth, and even what are called nerve growth factors uh, from the cell nucleus down to the ends. And so neurons can actually secrete nerve growth factors, and these are important because they can stimulate uh, sort of nerve regeneration to some degree in some of the nerves downstream. Um, at least can re-stimulate better synaptic connections. So that's enterograde transport. And that's mediated by a little protein motor using kinesin as the main protein there. That's kind of a little tidbit, not important to know, but just know that there's a little motor system that conducts these things down, almost like a little rail car system on, on train tracks. And then there's a retrograde transport, which transports from the axon terminals back to the, uh, back to the soma. And that often carries waste products from the axon terminals back to the soma to be recycled and broken down and so forth. And that's mediated by dynein, which is another motor protein. Um, and uh, so that's sort of a reverse transport system. Now, one really significant place this is important in is that certain viruses, specifically viruses in the herpes virus family, that includes uh, chickenpox, but also Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, and so forth, um, these viruses live inside of nerves. And so they get in through the skin they get absorbed into the axon terminals of neurons that are right there in the skin. And then, uh, so HSV is herpes simplex one. That's not HIV, that's herpes simplex one. That's a cold sore virus. Uh, let's say this is on your lip. So you got little nerves in your lip and sensory nerves. And the virus attaches to an axon terminal. It injects its uh, DNA, RNA, actually is able to travel up the axon versus the retrograde transport it integrates its DNA and RNA inside of the um, uh, your, the, the neurons uh, DNA. And then when your immune system is weak in the future or from a variety of other things, we don't really know why, the virus starts to replicate and starts to create the viral proteins and whatnot. And those then are shuttled down the axon they erupt out of the axon bulbs and they cause the characteristic skin irritation. And that's why, why herpes viruses infections can be so painful because they're right in the sensory nerves. Um, and they can live you know, in the soma of that nerve for decades. 
So in the case of the face, they live actually in the cell bodies of the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal is the major sensory nerve to your face. And there's three branches. There's one around your, your jaw, there's one kind of in the middle, and then one up by your eyes. And so um, it usually lives in one of those branches, and then it can erupt along that same branch each time. Uh, chicken pox, when that happens in the body, we get shingles. And that happens along a very specific area of the skin called the dermatome. Dermatomes are areas of the skin innervated by very specific sensory nerves. And so, uh, and those cell, those uh, viruses, the DNA is actually living up in the uh, cell bodies of your sensory nerves, which is up by your spinal cord in those dorsal root ganglia. And again, that can, those viruses can remain dormant for decades and then suddenly erupt outward. Um, so this is an example of how some uh, organisms like the viruses can actually hijack the retrograde transport system. Just a few words here on neuroglia. Again, they comprise the bulk of the nervous system, although that's the neurons that you know do the actual work in terms of the electrical signaling. Um, they uh, they make up about uh, neurons make up about 10% of the nervous system cells, but they occupy about 50% of the space in the CNS. Um, so the neuroglia are much smaller than the neurons, about five to 25 times smaller. Um, glia literally means glue. And that's because the early histologists like um, you know, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, they thought that this was just like filler packaging that kind of kept the neurons together. Uh, but we now know they have not just structural but also metabolic roles um, in protecting neurons. Um, they don't generate uh, action potentials like neurons do, but astrocytes, as I mentioned, can conduct these very special calcium currents, which is another communication system. They can multiply and divide, unlike most neurons in the CNS. So there's a lot of regenerative potential. Um, so as I mentioned, after, the, after birth, and especially after the age of three, there really is no new neuron growth in the central nervous system. There's a couple of exceptions. I mentioned the hippocampus, also the frontal cortex, part above the eyes. There's some new neuron growth there. Um, but pretty much after the age of three, the number of neurons is set and we lose neurons from that point forward, but the neurons interconnect better and that's what learning is all about. Um, in, brain, in brain injury, um, dead neurons are usually replaced by neuroglia. And then importantly, when we talk about cancers, cancer really is just a growth of a normal tissue that just suddenly starts to grow unchecked. Um, so the normal breaks on cell growth are removed and that cell starts to grow. Um, neurons do not form cancers, um, but glial cells do, and those are called gliomas. Um, these are usually highly malignant. They grow rapidly. And we'll talk all about brain cancers in the uh, neurology section. Um, most interestingly, most what we call brain cancers are actually not from the brain. They start in another organ like the lungs or elsewhere, and then they metastasize to the brain. Uh, that's called a secondary brain cancer. So most cancers of the brain are secondary brain cancers. Primary brain cancers actually start in the brain. They start from glial cells. And so there are some that starts from astrocytes, some that start from oligodendrocytes, and so forth. Uh, so an astrocytoma, for example, starts from astrocytes. Um, so again, cancers usually happen in cells that are continuously growing, regenerating, like the glial cells. Uh, mentioned that in the CNS, the oligodendrocytes produce the myelin. Um, so a single oligodendrocyte can myelinate several axons. In the PNS, it, these are the Schwann cells. And uh, these encircle the PNS axons. And uh, usually a single Schwann cell myelinates a single axon. And, um, and that actually, that Schwann cell can also branch out and enclose up to 20 or even more axons. Um, so a little difference in the structure there. Astrocytes, again, these are kind of the workhorses in terms of the metabolic activity. They really maintain structure of the neurons um, and they help support the neurons and help them make new synaptic connections with other neurons. They form the blood-brain barrier. So basically they form a wrapping around the endothelium of capillaries um, and uh, coming into the brain. And this, this uh, basically creates a selectively permeable or very selectively permeable membrane to different things coming from the blood into the brain. So a good example of that is because of the blood-brain barrier, most of what you drink in an herbal tea, for example, which is water-soluble, does not get into the brain. Uh, so the blood-brain barrier actually uh, 
stops that. And this can be a real problem with drugs like antibiotics for things like brain abscesses. The antibiotics typically will not cross the blood brain barrier. Um, and so things have to be done to kind of get them into the brain tissue. Uh, same with different chemo drugs. Uh, so what often happens is they administer a drug to actually break down the blood brain barrier first and then the drug can get in. We, we suspect that some neurological problems, even mental health issues, have to do with a breakdown or a leakiness of the blood brain barrier. You might have heard of leaky gut syndrome where the junctions between the epithelium and the gut break apart a little bit and so we start leaking in proteins into the blood which are not fully digested and they need to be processed by the immune system basically creating inflammation. Well the same thing might happen up in the gut. Um, one hormone interestingly we know that actually maintains the uh, integrity of the blood-brain barrier is melatonin. So if you have low melatonin because of poor sleep, melatonin is released at night, um, and then what happens is, is that you might be more susceptible to this kind of leaky blood-brain barrier. So I'll talk a lot more about that later, but that's uh, one example where astrocytes play in. They also secrete nerve growth factors, and these are this is basically like little hormones that stimulate the growth of neurons and uh, stimulate axonal regeneration. They're involved in nerve signaling with the calcium currents, um, and uh, they also clean up a lot of neurotransmitter wastes. So they help recycle neurotransmitters, and a lot of these neurotransmitters, if they don't get cleaned up, can overstimulate downstream nerves and create all sorts of problems on their own. And then they're helpful in, uh, we, we know they're very significant in learning and memory, and they help to form new neural synapses. Um, there's kind of an equivalent of an astrocyte in the peripheral nervous system, and these are called satellite cells. They're very flat, and uh, they surround the cell bodies of neurons, and especially in ganglia in the peripheral nervous system, like the dorsal root ganglia. They provide structural support, but also, again, help to provide metabolic support uh, for the neuron. Microglia are found primarily in the central nervous system. These are macrophages that are modified to be um, immune cells. Some of them are antigen presenting. They are capable of phagocytosis, so they can phagocytize antigens, bacteria, viruses, whatnot. And then ependymal cells, um, these secrete cerebral spinal fluid. So they're actually found lining the ventricles, the hollow pockets in the brain and uh, they can generate cerebral spinal fluid and then they secrete it into the ventricle. They also have these little hairs, cilia, on them, which are constantly beating. So what we now know is that the cerebral spinal fluid is beaten by these ependymal cells, which provides a current which stimulates the flow of that cerebral spinal fluid. So these are very important cells uh, for that. We also know embryologically that the ependymal cells are important for laying down some of the initial micro architecture of the brain and that neurons kind of fill in along those lines. So they're important for the brain organization and development. So that's a little on uh, glial cells. So again, uh, myelination, myelinated axons usually can conduct action potentials faster. Um, and um, the myelin itself is laid down by the Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. Again, oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. Um, the Schwann cells, you can kind of see here, here's the cell nucleus of the Schwann cell, and it kind of wraps itself like a, uh, like a hot dog bun around the axon itself. And so we see multiple layers of the Schwann cell. And the cell membranes of the Schwann cell are very rich in these different types of phospholipids. So there's a lot of phosphorus, there's a lot of fat. Um, all of these are important for um, that nerve conduction. The neural lemma, I think it was spelled uh, incorrectly in the previous slide there, is the outer membrane of the sheath. And uh, this is a neural lemma is found only around axons in the peripheral nervous system, not in the central nervous system. And these, uh, this is important for providing what's called the regeneration tube, which is something that can guide the growth of a new axon if there's axonal damage. And then the nodes of Ranvier are the little gaps that we see between the um, uh, little parts of myelin, and these are going to allow the extracellular fluid to touch the surface of the axon. And again, we'll talk more about why that's important in the next slide for maintaining action potentials. Uh, and then here's oligodendrocytes. Again, these are in the central nervous system. There are nodes. There's no neural lemma. Um, 
the oligocyte cell body and nucleus don't encircle the whole axon, they just reach out. So you can kind of see this. Here's the, uh, let's see a picture here. Here's the oligodendrocyte here. Notice how it creates, it sort of reaches out a tentacle. So instead of wrapping itself around, it sends out a tentacle, which then wraps around that axon. Um, there are nodes of RONVA, but they're much fewer in number. And um, uh, the oligodendrocytes, we think, might actually prevent further growth of new neurons if they're damaged. So there's some evidence that they inhibit regeneration of damaged axons. Um, in the central nervous system tissues, um, some regions look gray and some regions look white. I showed you that cross section of the spinal cord where we saw that. And um, that's, that's just looking at that with you know, gross visualization, some stains and dyes will bring that out further. But basically gray matter is composed of the neuron cell bodies, uh, den uh, the dendrites, and then unmyelinated axons, uh, axon terminals, and then the neuroglia, but no myelin. So gray matter is pretty much the cell bodies, the glia, all that kind of thing. Say this is more metabolic rich almost like this is an image of the metabolic activity in the brain. And then the white matter is composed primarily of the myelinated axons. And so this is more the true nerve activity, the conduction of the action potentials and whatnot. So we see a lot of white matter that's mostly the tracks of nerves um, that are going back and forth that convey signals versus gray matter is more the cell bodies, the, the glial cells and whatnot. So I mentioned that um, after the age of three, with a few exceptions, there's really little actual nerve regrowth in the central nervous system, a little bit more potential in the peripheral nervous system. Um, but we do uh, make better connections over time between nerves, and that's called neuroplasticity. So again, I mentioned the example of a stroke and how there's plasticity after that. Um, neuroregeneration um, is, again, something that we're looking at now in research using stem cells and whatnot. There's still a lot of work to be done. Just injecting stem cells into the spine or whatnot doesn't mean that we're going to regrow new neurons. There's a lot of other factors that have to be in place for that to happen. Uh, in the central nervous system, neurons are known as permanent cells. In other words, once you have them, you have them for life. If you lose it, you lose it. I mentioned the contrast to that would be down in your digestive organs. Again, another polarity here. The digestive act organs, like the inner lining of your intestines, regenerates every three days. So the epithelium in your intestines, your stomach, your small intestine, every three days is being uh, made completely new. Uh, the liver, usually those cells are dormant unless there's liver injury, but if you cut out, let's say, two-thirds of the liver, it will regenerate within a couple of months. The entire liver will regrow as long as there's no scar tissue like from cirrhosis or something there. Uh, but in the nervous system, that's not going to happen. You cut out a half the brain, it's not going to regenerate. Um, so these are permanent cells. But again, there is some evidence in the peripheral nervous system that uh, under the influence of nerve growth factors, and this happens too in areas like the hippocampus, that there is some limited uh, neurogenesis that can happen. Um, and um, but in the peripheral nervous system, there's more of a potential. I mentioned that oligodendrocytes can inhibit that property, um, but under certain growth, uh, with certain growth factors, there can be some further regeneration uh, if the cell body of that neuron is left intact. What typically happens in the CNS is that damaged areas are replaced by uh, astrocytes uh, or scar tissue. Um, by uh, collagen that's maybe laid down by the astrocytes. Um, spinal cord injuries, we'll talk more about the different types in the neurology section. Typical spinal cord injuries are usually crush injuries where the axons are left intact, uh, but the oligodendrocytes are damaged. And that can cause demyelination of the axons, uh, and that can temporarily stop all nerve impulses, both motor and sensory, going up and down the spinal cord. Um, there is, uh, what's interesting is that the axons, new axons can actually sprout from cell bodies again, but unfortunately because of scar tissue, they might not be able to regrow all the way down. And, um, so this is, um, a problem of regeneration in the spinal cord injuries. Um, now there's some interest in looking at how stem cells can be injected in there. Maybe a little scaffolding could be laid down. Uh, to allow those axons to grow. So those are some potential uh, areas of, of research. 
Um, so those are crush injuries. Other spinal cord injuries would be actual transection of the cord where the axons are just cut. And of course, as you can imagine, that's going to be very difficult. Even if new axons sprouted from the cell bodies, uh, they would probably not be able to cross that gap. And that gap's going to be filled with scar tissue. And so they wouldn't find the right place. So th these are some of the challenges in healing uh, spinal cord injuries. Um, again, the thought is that you can inject stem cells in there. Stem cells are cells which, under the right influence, will differentiate into whatever cell you need. So um, the hope is that this could be a way of maybe repairing spinal cord or even peripheral nerve injuries. But right now, a lot of the stem cell therapies are very experimental. And again, just injecting them into an area doesn't mean they're going to do the right thing without those uh, the right growth factors and whatnot. Um, in the PNS, again, there's some ability for regeneration. Um, so what can happen is if a cell body is intact, like a sensory nerve cell body, uh, but the axon is severed and the myelin is kept intact, what happens is that the axon will degenerate uh, downstream of that cell body. That's called Wallerian degeneration. And then the, um, the new phagocytes will actually come in, clean up that debris. Schwann cells will remultiply, forming a regeneration tube and then a new axon can sprout down and hopefully reach the new target or the intended target. And the growth happens at a rate of about one and a half millimeters per day. So this can take, you know, a year or more for some of these longer axons to regenerate. And they may not reach their intended target. They can actually overshoot the mark or, or go somewhere else. Maybe there'll be some numbness there, but there might be some restored sensation. Um, okay, so that's the basic concepts you need to know for neurophysiology. In the next videos, we'll look at the kind of details of nerve conduction uh, of the graded and the action potentials. And then we'll also look at um, uh, the neurotransmitters in more detail. What are the different neurotransmitters? What are their actions? And the, what are the big ones you need to understand? So um, that will wrap it up for this.